Hey everyone, welcome to the program. I am absolutely thrilled that you're here. Today we're going to be talking about the Kingdom of the Mitanni. Now, this is sort of a follow-up to the uh, last video that I did on the Hurrians. It's a pretty short video, so if you want to check that out before this one, I've put the link in the description. Now, essentially, since the last centuries of the 3rd millennium BCE, we have references to small Hurrian kingdoms and states that would appear in northern Mesopotamia. These, of course, would be quickly absorbed into the empires of the other peoples of the region, mostly from the south and the east. For example, the Akkadian Empire of Naram-Sin, the uh, Neo-Sumerian Empire of Shulgi, and of course the short-lived empire of the Amorite king Shamsi Adu, also known as Shamsi Adad I of Assyria. Now after Shamsi Adad's death, his empire also quickly disintegrated and was mostly absorbed into uh, the territories of his rivals. Out of these, several Hurrian states once again asserted their independence. Now perhaps to better defend themselves from the non-Hurrian peoples of the ancient Near East, these small kingdoms created a sort of Hurrian federation that became known as the Kingdom of the Mitanni. The origins of how the Kingdom of the Mitanni were actually formed is still a bit of a mystery, but by the 1550s BCE, they were already being mentioned in the various inscriptions of Egyptian pharaohs. Once established, the Kingdom of the Mitanni extended its power across northern Mesopotamia, northern Syria, and into eastern Anatolia. This was done through multiple ways, depending on the situation. In many cases, smaller states were coerced into joining them by becoming vassals or client kingdoms. Sometimes, especially as Mitanni power and reputation grew, diplomacy and a little bit of gold was all that was necessary. Though rapidly expanding, the Mitanni were checked in the west by another powerful and expansionist state, the Kingdom of Hatti, better known as the Hittites. For decades, the Mitanni and the Hittites would fight each other for supremacy in Anatolia and northern Mesopotamia. Now, already from some of the earliest Hittite texts, back when they were still just uh, an expanding kingdom, there are references to uh, conflicts with Hurrian peoples. One of these tells how Hattusili I, one of the greatest Hittite kings, was forced to abandon his campaigns in western Anatolia in order to defend from Hurrian invasions in the east. Now these Hurrian and by extension Mitanni attacks were probably in response to Hittite expansion in northern Syria. These areas at the time were occupied by the Mitanni. In the end though, Hattusili was able to return to Syria and nearly obliterate all resistance there. His successor, Mushili I, basically put the final nail in the coffin of the once glorious kingdom of Yamhad and its capital city of Halab, also known as Aleppo. That same year, 1595 BCE, Mushili I set out into Mesopotamia proper and sacked the city of Babylon. He didn't stay long though, and on his way back to Anatolia, he was constantly harassed by Hurrian forces. Mushili's successor, Kantili I, faced even greater and more dangerous Hurrian attacks. By his reign, the years between 1590 and 1560 BCE, the Mitanni and other Hurrian forces had all but overrun the Hittite lands in eastern Anatolia, ransacking cities and plundering them at will. Though he was eventually able to muster the forces to drive them out, Kantili's wife and two sons were captured in the process. The Hittites were in full retreat and they lost whatever possessions they once held in northern Syria and the Levant. The Mitanni were more than happy to step in. The kingdom of the Mitanni though weren't invincible, nor were the Hittites their only enemy. To their southwest was the ancient kingdom of Egypt. In order to create a defensive buffer between itself and the wider Near East, Egyptian pharaohs such as Thutmos I extended their reach into the lands of Canaan and the Levant. This though encroached upon the Mitanni-held territories in northern Syria. Thutmose the first successors though maintained a relatively lax policy towards their eastern provinces, which resulted in a weakening of their influence in the region. The Mitanni took advantage of this and began buying off Egyptian allies and client kings. This continued until the reign of Pharaoh Thutmose III. In the now famous Battle of Megiddo, Thutmose was able to rout the Mitanni's Canaanite and Syrian allies, especially those of the King of Kadesh. Such victories enabled the Egyptians to reassert their control of the eastern Mediterranean. Thutmose III was seen as a sort of hero 
to many of those who were enemies of the Mitanni, most notably the Hittites and the Assyrians. The Assyrians at the time were living under Mitanni rule in northeastern Mesopotamia. They, along with Kassite Babylonia, established closer relations with the Egyptians. Now these new relationships may have actually done something to check Hurrian power had it not been for the rise of the highly capable and cunning Mitanni king, Shaush Tatar. His exact dates aren't known, but he probably ascended the Mitanni throne around the year 1430 or perhaps even 1420 BCE. Though he didn't come into open conflict with Egypt, he did send considerable aid to Egyptian rebels in Syria and Canaan. Taking pressure off of his southwestern front, Shaush Tatar sought to punish Assyria for even daring to work with his Egyptian enemies. The Assyrians at the time were Mitanni vassals. For them to be working with the Egyptians was tantamount to treason. As punishment, Shaush Tatar launched a full invasion of Assyria, sacking and looting its capital of Ashur, including its most holy temples. He then headed back west through Mitanni lands towards the Mediterranean Sea. It was pretty much as far as he could go. If he went further south into Egyptian territory, he would have crossed a red line that the pharaoh would have been forced to respond to. With the Syria pacified and really facing no threat from Babylonia, Shaush Tatar could focus his attention on another age-old enemy, the Hittites. Now was a good time for him to strike. The Hittites, though a powerful kingdom, were still licking their wounds from the Hurrian invasion of years prior. They had also faced more local resistance from northern Anatolian peoples such as the Kashka and the Arzawa in the west. A betting man though would put money on an eventual Hittite victory and reconsolidation of both territories. And if history was any precedent, after this they would most likely steer their armies once again to the southeast and invade northern Syria. The Mitanni had to be ready for such a future attack. Such a scenario was probably what impelled Shaus Tatar's successor, Artatama I, to formally make peace with the Egyptians. The new Mitanni king opened negotiations with Pharaoh Amenhotep II, proposing an alliance between their two realms. In exchange for relinquishing any claims to southern Syria and Canaan, Artatama would be given the territories of northern Syria that had been contested by the two great nations in years prior. Negotiations went on for years until the reign of Pharaoh Thutmose IV. Both he and Artatama finally agreed to Egyptian control from the Red Sea up to the city of Kadesh, as well as the areas of Amuru and Ugarit along the coast. All territory beyond these was to be ruled by the Mitanni. To sweeten the deal, Artatama offered his daughter in marriage to the Egyptian pharaoh. Thus, at least on paper, or we can say papyrus, Artatama secured his southwestern flank from any major threats and was able to consolidate his hold over northern Syria. Should the Hittites attack, he could both focus on facing them as well as perhaps even get help from his new allies and, you could say relatives through marriage, in Egypt. Artatama though didn't have too much to worry about. The Hittites under Tudhalia III were embroiled in their own conflicts in Anatolia, most notably with the Kashka peoples and the Arzawa. However, in one of the greatest military and political reversals of all time, the Hittites were able to not only withstand their conflicts with the Kashka and the Arzawa, but regain virtually all of the territories that they'd lost during the past few decades. This was due in no small part to their new warrior king, Chupiluliuma. With Anatolia secured, Chupiluliuma turned his gaze once again to his southeast, specifically the areas of northern Syria that his ancestors had once held. Now, unlike with the Egyptians, the Mitanni were well beyond any reapproachment with the Hittites. Besides, with the Egyptians no longer a threat, militarily, they were a good match for any Hittite invasion into their realm. There were two things, though, that the Hittites had to their advantage. One was their amazing and fully capable warrior king, Shupiluliuma. The second was trouble within the Mitanni monarchy. When Artatama passed on, he was succeeded by his son, Shatarna II, who also proved to be a strong ruler. But his son and successor, Artashumara, was assassinated, bringing his younger brother, Tushrata, to the throne. 
However, Tushrata's claim was contested by another Archatama, who was possibly another son of the assassinated king. This new Archatama was actually more popular than Tushrata, who from evidence uncovered seems to have been the people's preferred candidate for king. To prove his might on the battlefield as well as perhaps silence any who may have challenged his authority, Tushrata went to war with the Hittites and Shupiluliuma. In their first encounter, Tushrata seems to have had the upper hand and routed Hittite forces. Still, Shupiluliuma was as clever diplomatically as he was on the battlefield. Playing one side against the other, he opened up negotiations with Artatama and acknowledged him as the legitimate king of the Mitanni. He also promised to support his claim to the throne once Tushrata was defeated. Now, the details of exactly what they had agreed to is unknown, but perhaps due to their new understanding, Shupiluliuma may have been able to enter deeper into Mitanni territory in an effort to engage Tushrata head on once again. In fact, Shupiluliuma almost captured Tushrata near the capital of Washukani. Now, he didn't take the Mitanni king, but he did take his capital city. In the end, Tushrata was actually assassinated by one of his sons, who I'll mention in a few minutes. This chaos within the kingdom of the Mitanni allowed the Assyrians under their king, Ashur Ubilit, to march directly into Mitanni territory and plunder its cities, including the capital of Washukani. It was an almost total reversal from decades before when the Mitanni had sacked the Assyrian capital of Ashur. Clearly, the Assyrians were on the rise. The Hittites, though, tried to manage their new Assyrian threat by pushing their own candidate for the Mitanni throne. For Shapiluliuma, it was of course Artatama, who in due course became Artatama II. This, though, didn't work out as planned. It seems that Artatama was playing Shapiluliuma. Though the two had an alliance, Artatama appeared to be very pro Assyrian. For example, he had supported the Assyrians in their sack of his own people's capital city of Washukani, as well as sent the Assyrian king, Ashur Ubilit, valuable gifts. This included all of the treasures that the Mitanni king, Shaustatar, had taken from Ashur nearly 60 years prior. You can imagine just how Shupiluliuma must have felt. Here was his potential puppet king, falling deeply into the orbit of Assyria. That wasn't all. Artatama's new fondness for Assyria put Shapululiuma's newly acquired territories in northern Syria, including Carchemish, at great risk. When Artatama died, his pro-Assyrian son, Shatarna, became king. In a move that no doubt shocked all of his contemporaries, Shapululiuma decided to support Shatiwaza, one of Tushrata's sons, as the new king of the Mitanni. Yes, this is the same Tushrata who Shupiluliuma had fought against in years prior. It may though not have been a total surprise. It was rumored that Shatiwaza may have been Tushrata's murderer. When Artatama took the throne, Shatiwaza fled to Babylonia, though he was denied refuge there by its Kassite rulers. Having nowhere else to go, after all he wasn't going to go to Elam or Egypt, he went to Shupiluliuma for protection. Seeing that he could be useful, Shupiluliuma welcomed him with open arms and even married him to his daughter. He then sent him to Carchemish to team up with a Hittite prince named Shari Kushu, who was the viceroy of northern Syria. With an army backing them, the two marched into Mitanni territory with little resistance. Thus, Shatiwaza was established as the ruler of whatever was left of the kingdom of the Mitanni. Now, as can be expected, Shutarna, the pro-Assyrian son of Artatama II, was pretty upset. That's an understatement, I would imagine. Think about it. Not only had he just lost his throne, but it was due to Shupiluliuma, who he thought was his ally. After all, Shupiluliuma had promised his father, Artatama II, that he would support his claim to the throne once Tushrata had been defeated. And, of all people, he had supported his arch-rival, Shatiwaza, whose father Tushrata had been one of Shupiluliuma's most hated enemies. Shupiluliuma, though, may have justified his actions, 
due to Artatama and Shutarna's close affiliation with Assyria. Now this could have all just been realpolitik on Artatama's part, but the fact of the matter was that the Assyrians were taking advantage of a situation that had been created by the Hittites. Now from this time onward, what remained of the Mitanni kingdom became known as Hanigalbat, and for the most part fell into the Assyrian sphere of influence. By the time of Shatiwaza's successor, Shutuara I, Hanigalbat had been reduced to an Assyrian vassal. The last Mitanni, or you could say king of Hanigalbat, Wasashata, rebelled against his Assyrian overlords. He was met with a crushing reprisal from the Assyrians, who by then had decided to do away with this whole vassal thing. They reorganized Hanigalbat into an Assyrian province and gave it its own governor, who reported directly to the Assyrian king. From then onward, most of the core Hurrian lands fell under Assyrian control, and the kingdom of the Mitanni, or its derivative Hanigalbat, was no more. Anyway, that wraps up uh, this particular program on the kingdom of the Mitanni. If you learned something from this program, please hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, and follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. As always, thanks so much for stopping by, keep the world safe for rock and roll, and catch you next time.